Welcome back to Chinatown Museum's third live stream for the month of June. Today, we will be doing Halo Halo Histories. Um, and our talk is called Halo Halo Bilo Kasher Sayan Edition. Today, we are joined by the creators of Halo Halo Histories, Michelin Suarez, Juni Garcia, Divine Hill Reyes, and Ben Jory Katindig. We'd also like to say hi to Manila for Kids and Philippine Cultural College main campus. Thanks for tuning in. Before we begin, can you let us know what is the oldest bill that you have with you right now? Can you please comment it down below on the comments? So yesterday, we asked you guys for the oldest bill that you have with you. Because today, we're going to learn more about them and the symbols that are on them. So, you know, just like a, as a visual guide. Hold on to those bills real tight because we'll be learning more about them in today's talk. And just as a reminder, we linked a worksheet on the event page. We will teach you how to use it and how to use it as an activity later down on the talk. Halo Halo Histories was created to make the study of Philippine history fun for people of all ages. Although our authors come from diverse backgrounds, such as theater, liberal arts, graphic design, film and TV, enthusiasm for history is a strong common ground for them. They are also recipients for the National Book Award for their first book in the series, entitled A Lo Long Time Ago which looks into our earliest ancestors and the way they live and the beginnings of our nation. And then that book is followed by the book we're discussing today, Kashai Sayan, which discusses the history of Philippine money. Their latest book in the series, Sino Bayani, Jose Rizal, is a spin-off from the main book series. It is a larger, fuller color format showcasing the little known facts about great Filipinos, in this case, Jose Rizal. So, before we begin, for the people interested in purchasing the book we are about to discuss today, or in fact, any of the Tahanan books I just mentioned, you may buy it at www.tahananbooks.ph. For inquiries on events, updates, and new releases, follow at Tahanan Books and at Halo Halo Histories on social media. We'd like to thank the authors for especially coming on to our show today because we have been wanting to put out historical content historical content that is tailored towards children. So, you know, for the kids out there, this one is for you. So everybody, let's welcome Michelin, Juni, Divine, and Benjor. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. All right, so are we beginning? Yes, we're turning over to us. Okay, that's great. Hi, everyone. We are the writers of Halo Halo Histories, and our second book is called Kashai Sayan, A History of Philippine Money. So you're probably wondering why on earth did we choose to write about money, and what does money have to do with history? Well, money has been part of our history since the beginning of since the beginning of our history. We've always had money in some form or another, and we've always used it to trade, to acquire things. And so we decided to take a look at how money is tied to our actual history. Money is something we use every day. Did you ever wonder why it looks the way it does? Why those people are on our bills? What those things are? Who makes the decisions about what goes on the bill? Have you ever wondered about that? We have. And so we decided to look into it and we found out just how closely money and history are tied together. And now I'd want to check if my other co-hosts are unmuted. Are you guys? Chime in, please. Hello. Yes, yes. We like money. <laughs> As you can see on the graphic, it also is because your money is basically like a selfie on a bill. If you look at yes. the pictures of all our money, there are photos of different, not photos, drawings of different people on them. And those people are all linked to our history. So when we look at our money, we're looking at little selfies of the Philippines and how it became what it did. Yes, and the, the cool thing about studying the history of our money, how it changed, is that it showed us when things about our country changed. When, uh, when we had new conquerors, our money changed. And uh, when we became independent, our money changed. And our money is like an art gallery about our country's history. You can see our heroes, significant events, values. Um, so it 
it will pay to take a closer look at the bills that we have in our wallets. Right. Yes. Let's get into it. Let's get into it, guys. Okay. First slide. Right. So let's start at the very beginning. A long, long time ago, right here, when the first peoples inhabited our islands, they had a way of buying and selling without money. How do you buy and sell without money? By barter or trading? Next slide. Now, can you tell me, um, in the first comic, look at the first comic. Our ancestors in the first comic are trading things they own for things they want. The man on the left makes an offer. He's offering his piggy. And the woman on the right makes a counter offer. She thinks she can get more than uh, get um, give get more than the little piggy for her sack of rice. So hopefully they both agree on what each other is willing to trade, and that's what barter is. Now, when I was in grade school, my classmates and I would trade stickers, stationery, and other things we like to collect: erasers, pens. Sometimes we would also trade our baon or lunch, just like in the comic on the right. What are some things you trade with your classmates? So, um, how did they do it? How exactly did they do it? Well, they traded with each other. The people who lived here traded with each other. But they also traded with people who came in boats from other lands. They did this for thousands of years which, uh, with other people from the places which today we call Asia, China, Southeast Asia, and even as far as India. How did they do it? Visitors would bring their items to trade and leave them on the beach while the locals behind the tree, if you can see they're hiding behind the tree, would watch from the shore. Then. The traders would leave, watching from the boat, and the locals would come out of hiding and bring their items to trade on the same beach. They would take turns coming out of hiding and going back on the beach, um, adding and subtracting what was on the beach until both sides were happy and took their purchases home. This is the original no contact delivery and it's making a comeback today. Now, why did, why did they have to do it that way? Why did they practice no contact delivery? Can anyone guess? Well, because back then, you never really knew if visitors came to fight or to trade. So either friendly or not friendly. So this was a good way of keeping a safe distance. When they got to know each other better, trading was done face to face. So, can you guess what local items we traded with our visitors? What did we trade? We traded forest products, things that we grew here, things that we found here in nature. So that would include swallows' nests, pearls, gold dust, sharks' fins, sea cucumbers, beeswax, things like that. Now, um, can you guess why they would want, our visitors would want those things? Well, swallows' nests are special food for the people in China. I think um, sharks' fins as well, and other things were used for medicine. Uh, beeswax was used for making candles, making cosmetics. Yes, they had lipstick back then. Uh, polishing furniture. So those are the things that they couldn't find where they lived and they wanted from us here because we had them in abundance. Now, what did we trade for? What did they bring that we wanted? We traded for, what do you think? We traded for things like silk, pottery, buffalo. Yes, they brought animals here. Hardware, like weapons. Uh, axes, knives, farm implements. 
so if you if you look at your your Lola's house, maybe she has an antique Chinese vase. Those are one of the things we traded back then. Now, this seemed to be a good arrangement for some time, but it's not always easy to trade. What do you think are some problems that you can encounter while trading? Off the top of my head, from my own experience trading stickers, it would be something like, um, I think my sticker is worth much more than your sticker and I'm not willing to trade my sticker for yours. Or the other person has too many of the same. Uh, I have my, my baon, it's chippy and clover chips and the other person also has chippy and clover chips. So he doesn't wanna trade with me. Shelf life, uh, shelf life, some of the things that you would trade, by the time they got here, they're rotten. So it's not easy to trade those. Um, other things were not easy to bring along, like, like live animals, like the water buffaloes mentioned earlier. How do you bring that on a boat and how many do you bring? Slaves too, because you have to feed them while, you, while they get here. And finally, too much of the same thing. Too much of the same thing means nobody wants anything. I've got a question for everybody out there. If it was your turn to trade something, what would you want to trade? And what would you want to get for your trade? Think about it. You might be able to start something new, some kind of new trading barter system in your school or your neighborhood. It's just something to think about. I would trade okay. my old games for new games, like two old games for one new game. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, peep, next slide. Yeah. So, what did people do? They had this problem with trading stuff. It wasn't as easy as they thought it would be. People came up with a working solution called proto money. What is proto money? Proto means early, and money means money. So, it's the earliest form of money. This is the use of commodities that everyone would agree had value and everyone would accept. Um, various items have been used by different societies at different times. Aztecs in Mexico used cacao beans. Norwegians once used butter. In China, they used tea bricks for money. Roman soldiers were paid in salt, where the word salary comes from because salt is sal in Latin. So salary comes from the word, from being paid in salt. Human slaves have also been used as currency around the world. In our islands, we also use salt. We also used eggs, cowrie shells, and rice. Rice is biodegradable money you can eat. Isn't that convenient? So, but there was one well, there were some commodities that were more widely accepted than any other kind of proto-money. And can you guess what that is? That's right. It's gold. And your parents will know how to sing this, sing this bit to you. Um, so silver and gold were the earliest forms of proto-money, widely accepted across trade routes. In our islands, we, we have much more gold than silver. So we would use gold more. We would make payments with gold in the form of dust, nuggets, jewelry. So people would bring along little scales and weigh, weigh the gold. And uh, that's how they, they used it as money, by weight. Gold was not only used for buying things, because by this time society had, had developed a bit more, it was also used for paying taxes. Yes, there were taxes back then. And tributes. Tributes are like um, when gifts to other leaders as peace offerings or to honor them, or when they visit your island, they give you a tribute in the form of gold or gold and gifts. That's what gold was for. Here are some 
awesome ways that we we would work our gold. We had so much gold in the Philippines that we were actually very known, very well known in the region for making beautiful and intricate gold jewelry. We made not only jewelry with it, we made weapons, also household objects, decorative items. We had a lot, we had a lot of gold. And if you can see the, take a look at the necklace on the left. Do you see all the little beads? They look like a dragonfly, all strung together. That's not easy to make. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's still one of the finest forms of metal work today. The next one is a special sash, a gold sash that uh, leaders and chiefs would wear. And then you have rings. Isn't that convenient? You can wear, wear, carry your money in a ring and then when you wanna buy something, you take off the ring and pay for it. And these little things, these little round things on the bottom right, they are called, they're little beads called piloncitos. And the smallest was around the size of a mongo bean. There were bigger ones, but the smallest was around that small. And this could actually be considered the first coins. So here we are moving from jewelry, from trading goods to using gold, to using it in jewelry. And finally, some sort of coin-like coin -like things, that beads that we use as money. Next. So that was the way business was done in our islands. We were a thriving and active trade center for centuries because the area where Binonda is now is close to the water, it's close to the river. So that's where people would take their boats, park their boats. The rivers were our highways before. We didn't have streets, but we had lots of rivers and waterways. So it was a place where commerce was done early on in our history, way, way before it was even called Binondo. Now we're looking at um, pictures, paintings from a book called the Boxer Codex, a very, very old book. It's a book of paintings and drawings of what ancient Filipinos looked like that was done by, um, they're not sure who, but they think it might have been a Chinese painter. Can you tell, can you tell which photos show the rulers or rich folk? Can you tell which ones are the rulers? Take a look at what they're wearing. The ones that with the most gold, the most jewelry, are the probably the chief or the datu or the sultan. And uh, that's, the, the, that's a couple on the left and the top middle. See what they're wearing? Lots of jewelry in, those, in their outfit. Now, who are the regular folk? Who do you think are the regular, regular citizens back then? I think, if I were to guess, that they would be the couple, second picture from the left. They look like they're nicely dressed, but not too extravagant. They're not wearing jewelry. So I think they would be kind of like regular folk. Now these two on the right are dressed very differently. Can you guess which, what the people on the top right do? The ones with the tattoos, can you guess? Well, these people are warriors. That's why they have all the tattoos. They want to look fierce and uh, like they, they can handle a lot of, ha they've been through a lot of battles. So you're, you're not just supposed to put tattoos on yourself just for, just for fun. You have to earn them. So those people must have had a lot of battles. And on the bottom, bottom right, those are slaves. So they're just wearing the bare minimum and they have no adornment at all. And uh, so these are, this is the kind of society we had when, uh, when, this paintings, when these paintings were done. 
And then, so now something happened, something, something important happened. Simula ng salapi, how currency came to our shores. This is um, a different chapter in our history. Now, take a look at this picture. We had, remember, we had visitors coming and going from all over Asia, trading, uh, trading with us and um, forming, forming friendships with, with uh, the local chiefs. But this time, some different visitors came along and they weren't interested in just friendly trading. Can you spot them? Okay, that's right. There they are. Did you guys see those guys under the tree? Look at their faces. We finally had visitors from the other side of the world. Spain, that's really on the other side of the world. They came looking for spices, which we don't have much of, turns out. But can you tell why they look so amazed? What are they looking at? The picture isn't in color, but you can, you can see what they are looking at is what people are wearing and people are wearing a lot of jewelry, a lot of gold in this, in this drawing. So they, they look pretty impressed by what they saw. And I guess that's one of the reasons why they decided to stay. So Spain is a long way off. How did, how did they reach the Philippines? Well, our islands from halfway around the world, more than halfway. They rode these big ships called, big for the time, called galleons. And they were known as the stallions of the sea. I think that's a nice name. Why? Because they carried a lot of stuff. They carried a lot of stuff in the cargo holds. These, these galleons were quite amazing, if you think about it. They crossed all these vast oceans powered only by wind. They were full, they were heavy, heavy with precious goods, silver and gold being transported from their colonies to Spain and vice versa. No wonder pirates went after them. They were also used for war. So naval battles, in naval battles against rival empires like the Portuguese and the British Empire. So our first Spanish visitors, who later became our conquerors, arrived, and they brought with them their money. Since they were our bosses, their money became our money because the boss gets to decide things like that. So our money began to look different. Not only that, our islands were grouped into one country and finally given a name, the Philippines. Now, these are the first these are examples of the first coins they brought with them. They were made by hand. So what they would do is they would melt silver and gold and then pour them into thin strips and then cut them into approximately the same weight. Then they were stamped with a Spanish seal. So that's why they look like that. See, they're not perfectly shaped. They're cut and shaped by hand. Do you see with the coin with the eight on it? Do you see it? There, there it is. This coin is about 28 grams of silver and it's known as the famous pieces of eight of pirate treasure, right? You hear about that? The pieces of eight, that's what they were looking for, those coins. That's why they raided those ships. <clears throat> now in those days, People didn't know how to get from one side of the world to the other by boat. They only knew by land. Hmm. Suddenly, with a little bit of skill and a little bit of luck, Spanish ships discovered they could travel back and forth to Asia by ocean. How important is this? So can you see the route? Acapulco is in Mexico. At that time, they didn't know what was on the other side of that wide ocean. But they discovered that Asia was on the other side. 
they, all, they thought they could only get to Asia through land, through Europe. So how important is this, that they discovered this route by ocean? So imagine there are only two airports, or in those times, ports, shipyards, connecting Asia to Europe. And imagine that only your ships, your ships get to use these ports. This super secret trade route, known only to Spain, was called the Galleon Trade, and it lasted for 250 years. So it was super secret, they, uh, state secret. They could not share, they would not share it to anyone because they wanted it for themselves. So the only way for Europe to get the treasures of Asia by ocean, the treasures, goodies from the empires of China, Thailand, Cambodia, and Japan, that was the only way to do it. So if, if, you, if you're the one who owns the ships, wow, you would be very, very rich. Under good conditions, the sea travel took three to four months. To ride as a passenger would cost 3,000 silver pesos, which is the equivalent of, guess how much today? $51,000 US dollars. That's how valuable one person's spot on the boat would be. So in those 250 years, around 110 galleons sailed this route. Most of these galleons were made right here in Cavite with Philippine hardwood. Some ships didn't make it. They were shipwrecked by storms or taken by pirates, but most did. And the galleon trade made the Spanish empire very, very rich. So, here are the items, here are some of the things that they, the galleons brought back to Manila from Europe and Acapulco. You can see books, well, books are not in, uh, books, books are in the picture. Glass, glassware, drinking glasses, horses and cows. Chocolate, so you have to the galleon trade to thank for chocolate. Coffee, that's very important. Corn, tobacco, tomatoes, avocados, and silver from the South American mice. Why was silver so important? Because in China, that was the accepted currency. So if they want to buy stuff from China, they got to bring silver. And silver was in abundance in South America, which the Spanish also conquered. Now, what were the things that the ships brought back to Europe? These are items imported from Japan, China, Thailand, Cambodia, and other Southeast Asian kingdoms via Manila. So you have Chinese porcelain, silk, gemstones, ivory, spices, gunpowder, very important, and luxury goods. So you always, these were items that were in demand in Europe. So status symbols, just like when you buy something from abroad and you're the only one who has it here. It's special, right? You're willing to pay a lot of money for it. That's what, that's what the galleon trade brought back and forth. Now we go to another form of money they brought. Remember earlier, the coins were made by hand and they weren't perfectly shaped. Now they were made by machine. That machine on the left is called a screw press. And you screw the coin at the bottom. It's still made, kind of made by hand, but now it's more even. Uh, they are more even in size and shape. This is called the dos mundos or pillar dollars. And they were made in Mexico. And they are regarded as one of the most beautiful coin designs ever produced. So can you see why? Well, why? What's on the, what's on the coins? There's a lot of symbolism on those coins. Can you see the two globes in the middle of the left coin? That represents the old world, Europe, and the new world, Americas and Asia. Then we also have the pillars of Hercules there on each side, which represent the Straits of Gibraltar, which you have to pass through to get to, um, to, get to the new world. Both worlds are one. It's a Latin phrase. Can you see? Vitrake venum. Both worlds are one. The old world and the new world are united. 
and plus ultra, the royal motto meaning more beyond, the Spanish coat of arms that's on the right coin, the back of the coin, they're on the right. Can you see there's a lion and a castle and a crown on it? That's the Spanish coat of arms. And the name of the king in Latin, you can't see it very well, but it's kind of like at the bottom of the coin going this way. Ferdinand the sixth. No. Yes. Okay. So that's, there's a lot of symbolism on these coins. They're very well thought out and very well designed, don't you think? So aside from these, more coins came along as um, in the 350 years the Spanish were here. These are known as portrait coins. Why? Well, obviously they have portraits of people on them. Now, if you were the reigning king or queen, you get to have a coin made in your image. How cool is that, right? So on the left, you have King Carlos, 1775. This coin was minted, so he was king during that time. Then on the top right, the gold, the guy with the beard, King Carlos III. Oh, King Alfonso the 12th. And then right beside him, the smaller gold coin, that's Queen Isabel II. The Isabel coins were very popular and were also known as Isabelinas. And I think they were popular because the design was, she looked so cute on the coin. That's, that's just what I think. But can you guess which coin was not very popular? Can you guess, Ben? What coin is not very popular? Uh, I'm guessing, uh, I don't know, he kind of looks weird. The one on the left. That's right. That's right. He wasn't very popular because it wasn't a very good looking rendition. Either the, the one who drew the coin didn't like the king or he really kind of looked like that. So not a very popular coin issue. But okay, there was one place in the Philippines that the Spanish coins were not used. The southern Philippines, the region of Mindanao, where Spain could barely get a foothold in all of the 350 years that they were here. The Muslims of Sulu in the southernmost islands traded actively. They continued to trade with their neighbors, the Arabs, Chinese, Bornean, and British traders. So they had their own coins. The sultans of that region issued their own coins as early as the 5th century. That's pretty early. Paduka Batara is one of the sultans of Sulu. Um, I think this is supposed to be a drawing of him on his boat. And uh, just as a side story, he went to China on a tribute mission, which is like a state visit today. So we had relations with other kingdoms. Unfortunately, he died and was buried in China, and up to this day, he still has descendants living in China. So proof of our international relationships way, way before modern day. So that concludes my segment, and I'm going to hand over to Divine to take charge of what happens when, uh, when all these coins come into circulation and it gets a little hard to deal with. Thanks, Micheline. Money has been around for so long that we forget that, you know, it's, it hasn't always been the case. So if you guys are interested in the book and you want to learn more about money, you can purchase the book at www.tahananbooks.ph. For increase and updates on events and new releases, follow at Tahananbooks and at Halo Halo Stories on social media. So... Divine. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you see me? Am I on? Yes, we can see you. All right. So, um, this chapter is called Mula sa Maynila. Uh, we will learn about the time when we started producing money locally. And um, several factors led to this. As we learned earlier, coins became a trend. Everybody was so happy carrying coins in their purses and buying stuff. But there was a problem. What if one coin can, uh, is worth four fish, but you only wanted two? Do you chop the coin in half? So um, the need to buy smaller items led to the creation of the barilla or barilla.
Tia. These are copper or bronze coins with smaller value, and they were produced in Cavite. This is where the word barya comes from, by the way. It means lose or small change. Okay. Another important world event contributed to this coin fusion. Remember the galleon trade that Micheline talked about? It ended in 1815 with the Mexican Revolution and the opening of the Suez Canal. And shortly after that, the steamship was invented. So why is this important? The Suez Canal created a shortcut. So it cut travel time from Spain to Manila from four to seven months to only 40 days. Okay, so before, maybe um, in the 17th century, a trip from Spain to the Philippines took a year. So imagine if you said, mom, I want to go to Spain for my 10th birthday. You have to ride the boat when you're nine to get there for your 10th birthday. And then around 1850, um, it took 100 days to travel, uh, to travel from Spain to Manila. And then because of the Suez Canal, the travel time um, was shortened to about a month. Okay, so because of this, the more frequent travel from Spain to Manila brought in a lot of coins minted in Spain. And there were a lot of coins. As Micheline said earlier, every time there's a new king or queen, you have new coins. So more and more coins uh, flooded um, uh, our country. So it made it more confusing for everybody. So the Spanish government said, we have to standardize the money in Filipinas. And the Casa de Moneda de Manila, or the House of Money, was established in 1857. So this is a photo, um, thanks to the Chinatown Museum for, for lending us these photos. This is how the Casa de Moneda uh, looked like. It, um, it uh, minted uh, three types of gold coins, so four peso, two peso, and one peso coins. There. So now we have our own money. People were able to buy and sell more easily. And when business grew, they made more money too. But there's a new problem. Can you imagine carrying around and storing lots of coins on your person, on your body? What if you have too many coins in your pocket You're, right now? Your pants might fall off, right? Or what if you have all your money in a big purse or sack? Will you be able to carry that around while you are shopping? How are you going to carry the rest of the goods? So Spain decided to innovate by borrowing an idea from Asia. Paper money. Paper money uh, has actually been around since the 13th century. It was invented by Genghis Khan of the Mongol Empire. When he became emperor, he seized everybody's silver and gold and gave them back paper bills in return. The paper bills guaranteed the emperor, uh, uh, no, I mean the emperor guaranteed that the person, that they, he would give the equivalent of what was printed on the paper in silver. So it's like um, the earliest government promissory note. So going back, uh, Europe adopted the use of paper money. The first banks in Europe uh, began building safe houses and issuing certificates. So the safe, safe houses became the banks. And Spain brought that concept to the Philippines. And in 1851, we got our very first banco. It was called El Banco Español Filipino de Isabel II, and it printed the first banknotes in the country called pesos fuertes. Pesos fuertes, uh, they mean um, strong pesos. Oh, by the way, did you know that El Banco Español, Filip uh, Español Filipino still exists today under a different name? Can you guess what it is? It's BPI or Bank of the Philippine Islands. So, um, with a more convenient way to carry money, commerce in Manila grew. Remember the photo that Micheline showed you earlier when they would trade near the shore? Now, because of money, which is more convenient, people started selling um, inside the, um, um, in the cities now. So, um, they have their wares, their goods on the streets, and people can choose uh, more easily. This is how a typical market scene in Spanish colonial Binondo looked like. 
Um, and remember these photos because later on we will show you how the market scene evolved in, um, in this area. So, um, at the end of the galleon trade, foreign traders used Indios and Chinese mestizos as their middlemen, who eventually became the Ilustrados or the Filipino educated class. And the next chapter gets exciting. This is the part where so much change happened in the country within 50 years. And this was all reflected in our money. The Philippines fought so many epic battles and our history is as exciting, if I may say, as Star Wars. So let us begin with episode one. When the Filipino force awakens. Okay, so after more than 350 years of Spanish rule, the Filipinos got fed up with how the colonial government treated them. So the, the revolution started in 1896 and ended in 1898 when General Emilio Aguinaldo waved the Philippine flag in Cavite on June 12, 1898. We just recently celebrated our Philippine Independence Day. And this historic event was commemorated on a previous design of a five peso bill. So this is what we were saying uh, earlier when our money is like a, an art gallery or a, you know, leaves of a history book of our country because um, important events are commemorated here. So this five peso bill, you won't see that now, but your parents might still have them in the house somewhere. Okay, let us uh, show you this photo of El Ochenta y Dos. Okay, um, why is this important? This was a shop uh, that sold hardware and art supplies. And um, it, was, uh, uh, it was named um, after the cholera epidemic, which ended in 1882. By the way, it was also the store's phone number. And this store was owned by a man uh, named Roman Ong Pin, a Filipino-Chinese businessman. So why was this important? Um, this became a hangout for our revolutionary heroes. This is where they would discuss, you know, um, the issues uh, between uh, uh, in Spain and Philippines. And that's where um, revolutionary uh, newspapers like La Solidaridad and other publications were sold. So um, here are more pictures of it. And uh, it was uh, 1882 was a special year because it was like the bounce back year uh, of uh, after the cholera epidemic. Maybe you think um, after the coronavirus pandemic, we will have new places, new cool places to hang out. And will they be named after the virus or after our bounce back year? We don't know. Okay, now that the Philippines was free from Spain, we started printing our own money with our independent country name, finally. So in that coin, you will see Republica Filipinas, 1899. And um, these, uh, uh, these bills were hand-signed to prevent counterfeiting by three gentlemen, Pedro Paterno, Telesforo, uh, Tridian, and Mariano Limhat. So imagine, kawawa naman, pagod na pagod yung hands na may signing bills every day. So those are called the 1898 Aguinaldo banknotes because that time, um, Aguinaldo was the head of the, um, our first republic. Okay, but our victory party of 1898 was a very short one. While our brave countrymen were fighting Spain, Spain was also under war with America. The Spanish-American War ended in 1898 also. Uh, and at the Treaty of Paris, Spain turned over many of its colonies to America, including the Philippines. And speaking of money, we were sold to the U.S. for $20 million, which was a lot of money way back when. And we didn't know that because the Philippines wasn't invited to Paris during the treaty signing. And this brings us to episode two. The U.S. makes a road move on the Philippines. There was a Phil American War that happened, and it's not really on, um, on our history books because that was a really, really painful time um, as well. Um, we didn't know that we were turned over to the U.S., and so by the time we realized it, they were already here. And you know what that means? New boss, new money. This is how our money looked like under um, the American period. Don't you think they look like dollars? Of course, because it was um, uh, designed 
by uh, Americans. So kids, c- can you um, recognize who are on the bills? Okay, on the top left is, am I reading it right? It's McKinley. On the right is Magellan. And then bottom left is George Washington. And bottom right is Legazpi. So Magellan and Legazpi are the Spaniards who colonized us. So it's like being colonized all over again. That's what it is. Okay, but in 1928, we also had these um, really pretty bills, the, uh, uh, the Banco, uh, the BPI, um, printed them in 1928. And these are, this is a, it's a series featuring women. This is called the Good Luck Series because uh, these are, they're like muses who brought good luck. Your money brings good luck. And during the American period, uh, we were called the Pearl of the Orient and Paris of Asia. So after fighting the war, um, there were developments uh, made uh, in, the, in the country. And we had beautiful boulevards, we have beautiful buildings and um, uh, lights. And, and maybe, we, maybe we looked like Paris at the time. That's why we were called Paris of Asia. And Manila was considered a modern city because it had efficient public transportation. One of them which is the Tran Via, or the streetcar. So, similar to the streetcars in San Francisco, if you go there a lot. And uh, this is Escolta, this is a photo of Escolta. Uh, the very first ice cream parlor was located here. And remember the picture of the Minondo Market before where they will sell on the streets? Now we had shops and buildings. Okay, another building we want to show you is um, called Hecox. It's an upscale department store that carried clothing, shoes, cosmetics, jewelry, sporting goods, and gifts. Oh, it's like um, it's like your SM today, diba? or your Robinson's Galleria, or your um, Ayala uh, Ayala Malls. So it moved from Echage, Quiapo to Escolta in 1910, where it stayed there until the post-war era. Its 8 million peso building in Escolta was famous for its electric doors and for the first building to be entirely air-conditioned. Oh, cool, you know? So, um, 50 years under the, um, the American period, uh, they were, little by little, we were allowed to take steps towards self-governance. And um, the, the U.S. Congress passed the tidings McDuffie Act of 1934, which granted us commonwealth status. So what is a commonwealth status? It's like a practice government. Uh, it's like they're training us to be independent, but we didn't have uh, the right to vote yet. Okay, so they chose the, the leaders uh, of the country. Um, and they promised us full independence uh, in 1946. So now, um, because of the commonwealth period, we change our money again. Our bills now say pesos instead of silver pesos. And it had a seal of the, gov- of the Commonwealth um, uh, symbol. It combined the American Eagle and the Spanish coat of arms with a revised shield and three yellow stars as a new Philippine element. So there's the element of Spain, and there's the element of, uh, of the US, and there's the element of our own Philippine flag with the three stars, waved by General Aguinaldo in 1898. Okay, so this is a sample of a Commonwealth bill, and this was in the collection of one of our co-creators, Benjar. So um, ask your parents or grandparents if they have a, a collection of old bills and coins. You'll be fascinated. Okay, so... Now, it, our bills say pesos, right? So did you know that the U.S. gave us the peso symbol? The pesos and dollars looked so similar. So the U.S. designated a symbol for our own peso. And the peso sign was born on August 3, 1903, in case you wanted to know. Okay, so a lot of, that, uh, a lot of things kept changing. It wasn't only our money. It was the landscape. It was our culture. It was society. So you can see we're uh, really... Now being a mix 
of uh, of cultures. We're really a halo-halo culture, diba? starting from the early trading, and then we have the Spanish influence, and then the American influence, and all that. And um, look at the look at this photo now. This is um, this is in Binon. It's in Escolta. And you see there are taller buildings now compared to the previous photos he, we showed you before. And there's traffic now. Okay? now there are a lot of cars. And um, the city was changing. It's more modern, like our currency. Oh, sorry. I forgot to mention the first United building. Okay, sorry, can you go back to the slide? Okay, that was built in the 1920s and it was considered one of the tallest buildings in, on the street already with five floors. All right, so more on the business district in Binondo. This is a photo of a crystal arcade. It was the first building to have air conditioning. It was designed by an architect named Andres Luna de San Pedro and this is the home to the first Manila Stock Exchange. The building was named because of, uh, because of the glass that looks like crystal at night. So remember these beautiful photos because the landscape will change again, okay? If you think that by this time, Filipinos have fought too many wars with the Spanish and the Americans and even the tribal wars way before then, World War II came, okay? And I will let Juni tell that story. Thanks, Divine. Learning more about money and how it was used in our past is not a topic that we focus on in school. So it's very interesting to hear about it now and on our talk. So if you're having fun at your Tahanan, you can purchase the book at www.tahananbooks.ph. For inquiries and updates on events and new releases, follow at Tahanan Books and at Halo Halo Histories on social media. At this point, we'd also like to shout out Philippine Cultural College main campus and Manila for Kids for tuning in. We appreciate your support. So our next segment will be with Juni. Juni, hello. Hello. I forgot to unmute myself. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, your sound is good. Can Take you it away. Can you hear me? I forgot. Yeah, the sound is good. You. All right, so. Thank you. So I've left, so we've left um, off with Divine in World War II. And we all know what happened in World War II. We were occupied by Japan. Now, obviously, every time a new country comes in, they're going to bring their own money with them. And so Japan brought in money too. But they didn't bring in the yen that we know about today. We had our own money from, that, from Japan at that time, and it was a peso. And it's coming up on the screen right now. Wait for it. There we go. On the left, you'll see Japanese money. It says the Japanese government, and then it says one peso or 500 pesos, or however much the denomination is. 500 pesos sounds like a lot of money. But during the time of World War II, when we were under Japan, it was almost nothing. In fact, we had a nickname for this Japanese money. They used to call it Mickey Mouse money. Do you know why they used to call it Mickey Mouse money? What is Mickey Mouse money? Okay, Mickey Mouse was a cartoon character, right? He's not a real mouse. He's a cartoon mouse. And that is how we felt about the Japanese money at the time. It wasn't real money to us. It felt almost like cartoon money. First of all, because it was made with very, very thin paper. It wasn't made very well. And second of all, because it was worth almost nothing. Here is a picture of a guy who owned this building that you see here. And all of that stuff around him is Japanese Mickey Mouse money. Because they were using his building to print the money. Now, all that money could probably buy you one pack of, probably one bar of chocolate or one bottle of soda or something like that. Japanese money was worth so little, people would have to carry sacks of it to buy very small things. But that was not the only kind of money we had at the time. We also had a secret money okay, called guerrilla money. Do you know what a guerrilla is? 
A guerrilla is someone who is fighting in what you call a resistance. They're fighting against whomever is leading the country at the time. And because it was a war, we had a guerrilla resistance that was fighting against the Japanese. And they had their own money. Now, because they were guerrillas and they were hiding out, they didn't have access to printing or anything like that. So they would make their money from whatever they could make it out of. So you would have some of it on notebook paper. You would have some of it on regular paper. You might even have some of it on brown paper bags. But they all shared the same format. They were all typewritten. If you don't know what a typewriter is, ask your mom or your dad or your lolo or your lola and they will tell you. It was typewritten and hand-signed again with a special serial number. And if you can see very closely, I don't know if you can see it well, but it says there that the value of the money is going to be given after the war. So it wasn't actually real money. What it says is that it's worth five pesos, and if you turn it in after the war, they will give you the amount on the paper. And they did. For the most part, everyone who had guerrilla notes were able to turn them in after the war. There might still be some floating around. Maybe someone forgot to exchange theirs. If you have your Lola, if your Lola or your Lola or your great grandfather or grandmother is still around, they might have guerrilla notes on them. You might want to ask. Or they might have seen them. We don't know. So that's about all that happened to our money during the Japanese occupation. But as we know, in 1945, World War II ended and General MacArthur returned just like he said he would. And among things that he brought with him were currency called uh, victory money, which was basically the same money that we had during the Commonwealth. But look, they stamped the word victory all over the same bills. They knew they were going to win the war. So even before they returned, they had already printed these victory bills. And so we started the uh, Commonwealth with the victory bills that you see. I mean, not started the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth came back to us with the victory bills that you see here. Same money, victory stamped on top. Of course, after the war, we finally got our Philippine independence from America on July 4. And the first thing we did was establish our own government. This was on July 4, 1946. Uh, here's a picture of what we looked like after the war. Remember that picture that we showed you a while ago of Pinondo? This is like the before and after. Look at that. Our beautiful, beautiful city now raised to the ground. It took a while to rebuild, and that is what we started working with after the war. Nonetheless, with the arrival of America, um, the war ended. America turned over to us our independence, and finally, we we were able to establish our own government, which of course meant establishing our own currency. Let's take a look at what happens in the next slide. Perang proudly Pinoy, because we now had our own republic, of course, we finally had our own money. Money that we made for our country, not made for us by someone else. But the very first series of our own money was actually called the English series. And do you know why? Because it was the only money in it was the only money from our republic that was actually printed in English. It was the last of the money that was printed with English on it, as you can see. And coincidentally, it was also minted in England. It was made in England um, by a printing press called give me a minute. I have it here. Yes, there we go. Thomas Delarue and Company Limited. As you can see here, we had um, five peso bills, 100 peso bills. We still had coins. Let's stand down sort of on the five centavo coin over there, if I'm not mistaken. If you want to know more about her, her story is in our book. And uh, I'm not going to give it away just yet. So after the English series, which was only demonetized in the... 70s, I believe. What comes next? Oh, here's a little slide that's just for fun that we stuck in there. Shall we take a look at that slide? Shall we go back? This is a menu for a fried chicken dinner. Can you guess what restaurant this fried chicken dinner was from? It's a restaurant that's still around today and you maybe you've eaten there. I know I eat there a lot. Can you guess? No, it's not Popeyes. It's not Jollibee. 
No, it's not KFC either. This is from Max. This is from Max's restaurant. Have you eaten chicken in Max? They call themselves the house that fried chicken built, right? And this is how much it cost to eat a fried chicken dinner in Max back in the day right after the war. A whole order of fried chicken was five pesos. And if you didn't have enough money, you could get a half chicken for two pesos and 50 cents. You could also get a spring chicken, which is a smaller whole chicken for that amount. And look at that. A whole steak would also cost five pesos. And if you could only afford half a steak, it would cost two pesos and 50 cents. And a soft drink, a Coke, would cost 20 centavos. An ice cream would cost 50 centavos. And a lumpia would also cost 50 centavos. And a halo halo would cost one peso. Can you imagine how much food you could buy if the prices at Max were still like this? Unfortunately, they aren't. But they used to be. So let's move on to the next slide. Now, because after the English, after the English series, all the remaining money that was produced in the country looked more like the money that we know today. It just evolved slightly. And I'm going to show you how that works. All the money we've had since then has looked kind of the same, but sometimes we might change it a little bit. For example, the five peso bill. It used to be a bill. I know that now it's a coin, but it used to be a green bill, as you can see here. And originally, in the Bagong Lipunan series, we had a picture of Andres Bonifacio on it. But later on, um, this is not in the photo, but later on, they were actually going to put uh, Ferdinand Marcos on the five peso. And it was going to say September 21, 1972. But we all know that things didn't go very well for Marcos, so they scrapped that idea. And instead, they put out a new 5 peso bill, now with Emilio Aguinaldo on it. Your mom and dad probably had this in their wallet during their school days as part of their allowance. I know I had it. Um, but after a while, to celebrate, to commemorate one of the birthdays of Andres Bonifacio, they put him back on the bill. Uh, the coin over there on your right. So we, we had Aguinaldo, we had Bonifacio, and then we had Aguinaldo. The gold coin is still Aguinaldo, I believe. And then just recently, we changed the coin and we put Bonifacio back on the coin. So Aguinaldo out, Bonifacio in. Let's see what happens in the next 10, 20 years. Maybe Aguinaldo will come back. Who knows? Here's another example. Look at our 20 peso bill. This is, I believe, still part of the English series with a beautiful lady on it, the Bank of the Philippine Islands on it, and look what it looks like now. Oh, what are we doing? Oh, okay. I'm not sure it's in order. Now it's in order. Okay, and now the 20 peso bill as we know it. And there it is. I believe this is, yeah, there we go. Now, this is a timeline of our Philippine money. Let me explain something to you about our Philippine money. All the money we've had now, each, each time we change it, we call it the change of a series. We have different series, okay? The first one was the English series that we've already told you about. The second one was our flora and, well, the second and third ones were the flora and fauna and Bagong Lipunan series. The Bagong Lipunan featured presidents and other important figures, but flora and fauna was a really pretty one. It featured a lot of the animals and plants that we find in the Philippines. The flora and fauna uh, series doesn't exist anymore, but you might still have some of them lying around in your house from your parents. And then now we had after the flora and fauna, the new design and the new generation bills. You've seen both the new design and the new generation bills because the new generation bills are just coming out now. In fact, the five peso just came out last year and I believe we've just demonetized the new design. If you don't know what demonetization is, it is when one kind of money no longer has value. So we are in between. We were just in between the new design and the new generation, and we've just fully come in to the new generation. Now, if you want to notice something funny, take a look at the pictures of the presidents on your money. 
you're going to find that, okay, so right now on our money, we have um, Osmeña on our 50 peso bill, I believe, and Rojas are on our 100 peso bill. And I believe we have Quezon on our, no, I'm on our 20 peso bill, if I'm not mistaken. If I am mistaken, someone chime in and correct me. And you'll notice that the guys who have, the presidents who have been on our money for a while, every time we put out a new version, they look younger, they look more handsome, and they, it's, it's like every time we put out a new bill, we reverse their aging a little bit. It's fun to look at how they change every time the money changes, and you should go check it out. Now, right now, on our currency, we've got two sides of the money. The front is called the obverse, and the back is called the reverse. And we wanted to do it that way so that people don't think one side is more important than the other. That's why they don't call it front and back. They call it obverse and reverse. Right now, if you look at your Philippine money on the obverse, you're going to find a picture on the, on the obverse of a Philippine president. And you're also going to find a picture of an important no, of a landmark, of an important landmark in our country. And if you turn it around in the reverse, there's going to be the picture of flora and fauna and I believe a certain historical events. I could have gotten them the wrong way around. You're also going to find on the back a picture of a Philippine weave. Each bill has a different weave on the back of it. And also on the front, you're going to find a lot of different security features that make our money hard to counterfeit. If you want to know what these are, and if you want to know who decides what goes on our money, and if you want to know how the money is made, it is all explained in our book. Now, we often take this money for granted, but if you really look at it, they're all beautiful works of art. And here's a little video that's going to explain a little more about that. You'd be right to call some of the world's banknotes a little boring or drab or unimaginative. My apologies for immediately offending about 1.3 billion people, but to someone who's drawn to colourful and shiny objects, you've got to admit, these aren't exactly the most exciting banknotes in the world. The Philippine Peso, however, is an explosion of colour, featuring natural wonders, native wildlife and historical figures, and in this video we're going to take a closer look at them and their hidden secrets. Twist denomination, the bright orange 20 peso. It sees the country's second president, Manuel L. Quezon, who also appears in the watermark and again in this box on the top left. There's also this cool tilt effect up here, where if you tilt the note and get the angle just right, you can see the number 20. The background features a Malacanang palace, plus a historical scene of when Filipino was declared the national language in 1935. The reverse sees an Asian palm civet in the foreground and the Banaue rice terraces at the back. Now this banknote is fairly low value, approximately 32p, 40 US cents, or 36 euro cents. And with the amount of wear and tear they receive in circulation, it was recently deemed more cost effective to replace it with a coin. Although I don't have one to show you, it retains Quezon's portrait from the banknotes, which are being slowly removed from circulation. Next comes a striking red 50 peso, featuring fourth president Sergio Osmeña, with an image of the country's first parliament on the left and of the Lite landing on the right, the first steps towards the country's liberation in the Second World War. The background, as with all denominations, is made up of microprint text. On the back can be seen a pair of giant trevelli fish in front of Tar Lake, a crater lake within which is an active volcano, which itself has a smaller crater lake within. Like all the notes in this series, the featured species glows under UV light, and these random flecks within the paper become visible. Whilst ordinary paper simply glows bright blue, and ordinary banknote paper doesn't glow at all, the Philippine Peso has added these tiny fluorescent strands into the paper at the pulp stage as an additional security feature. Things start to get really interesting with the 100 peso note. It features 5th president Manuel A. Rojas alongside the country's central bank to his left and a historical scene of the proclamation of the Third Republic on his right. The reverse features a Mayon volcano and a whale shark, which is a seriously cool animal to have on your currency. But when it was released, this note was deemed too similar in colour to the all blue 1000 peso, particularly this middle section. Though it might seem easy to tell them apart here in perfect lighting, imagine you're a taxi driver working at night, or you work in a dark club or bar or somewhere. It created enough problems to warrant a reissue of the note, fully purple. Today both notes circulate simultaneously, but the old style are no longer printed and becoming increasingly rare to find. 
but it certainly isn't the rarest peso note. That title goes to the 200 peso, often referred to as the $2 bill of the East. Although I couldn't find any reliable figures, this denomination is rarely seen in circulation, and many of the country's residents have never even seen one, and nobody seems to know why. What's more, it's a note of very useful value, worth about 4 US dollars and bridging the gap between the 100 peso and the 500 peso, so it should rightfully be a very common banknote. If you know the reason, please let me know as I've gone slightly mad trawling the web for answers. But anyway, it sees the country's ninth president besides the House of Independence and the Baraswain Church. Although these images were slightly updated in 2017, the reverse features Atasia against a backdrop of the country's gorgeous chocolate hills. Next, it's a vivid yellow 500 peso, portraying the country's 11th and first female president, Corazon C. Aquino. Beside her is her husband, Senator Benigno S. Aquino Jr., who was assassinated in 1983. To the right is a statue in his honor, and on the left a scene from the People Power Revolution that followed his death. Interestingly, it was dubbed the Yellow Revolution, since many protesters wore yellow ribbons, which explains the color of the note. And even more interestingly, the couple's son went on to become president himself and was in office at the time of the note's release. His signature can be seen to the right of the portraits. The reverse features a blue-naped parrot and the Puerto Princesa subterranean river and was subject to quite some controversy. Firstly, the parrot's beak and feathers are incorrectly coloured, later revealed to be a limitation of the printing method used. And then the little dot that indicates a river on the map of the Philippines is slightly incorrect. I mean, it's not exactly the biggest error in the world. I'm looking at you, Australia, and your $2.3 billion typo. But then the 1,000 peso came under fire too. The front depicts three famously heroic figures who died resisting the Japanese occupation during World War II. To the left are crowds celebrating the centennial of Philippine independence in 1998. A South Sea Pearl is featured on the reverse, with the Tubataha Reefs National Park in the background, including some cool looking fish and a sea turtle. Again though, this denomination was criticised for the location of the map marker. Now this time the location is quite dramatically wrong, but the printers explained they moved it so it wouldn't interfere with this, a UV security mark of the featured species. I suppose it makes sense, but it would have made more sense to just not include a marker at all. And on all six notes, the province of Batanes was entirely excluded from the map. Though again, this was a conscious design choice, essentially cropped out since it was too far north. Despite these minor criticisms, the Philippine peso has truly joined the ranks as one of the most beautiful, interesting, and certainly colorful currencies on the planet. Not only do they detail significant events in the country's history, but they showcase the very best of its natural wonders and indigenous wildlife, resulting in a series of notes that faithfully honour such a wonderful country. All right. Can you hear me? Yes? Are we good? So just in case, well, we just like to see if you guys have been paying attention. So we've prepared a little pop quiz for you to see how much of what we said stuck in your head today. Are you ready? Shall I begin the pop quiz? Yes, I shall. All right. I'm going to ask some questions now. Can you name at least two problems we encountered with early trading? This is from Michelle's part of the talk. Can you at least two? There are about five, I think. Three, four. There are five. Okay. If you answered that there was difficulty matching needs, agreeing on value, the shelf life, the difficulty with transportation or that there were too much of the same thing, then you got that right. Good job, okay? You only needed two out of those five. Shall we go into the next question now? The next question is, what country did our first coins come from? We've had a lot of coins over the years, but the first ones came from where? If you answered Spain, you got it absolutely right. Good job. Shall we move to the third question? 
What Filipino word was born out of the copper and bronze barilla? You remember the barilla from our early currency? And do you remember what word came out of that? If you answered barya, you got it absolutely right. Let's take a look at the next question. Who invented paper money? Give it a think. I'll give you a clue. Is there someone in Asia? If you answered Genghis Khan, you got it absolutely right. Let's take a look at the next question. What event was El Ochenta y Dos's name commemorating? Or why did Roman Ongpin name his store El Ochenta y Dos? Because, this is a longer answer to type, so let's wait a minute. He named it this way because this was the year of the end of the cholera epidemic. Bonus points if you remember that that was also the phone number of the store. Let's take a look at the next question. What country did our peso symbol come from? Who gave us that peso symbol? Do you remember? Yep, our peso symbol was given to us by America. Next question. What country gave us Mickey Mouse money? If you answered Japan, you got it right. Japan gave us what we called Mickey Mouse money. Next question. Which president enjoyed time on the five peso bill? If you remember... There were two people battling it out on the five peso bill. Only one of them was a president. Yep, it was Emilio Aguinaldo. He was the president on the five peso bill. Next question. Who is now featured in the five peso coin? It was Aguinaldo before. Who is it now? It's his money frenemy, Andres Bonifacio. That's right. I don't know if that answer will be true in the next 20 years. Let's find out. And the last question. How many different denominations do we now have in our currency? I'll give you a minute to think about all the coins and bills that we have. Think about them in your head. The answer is 12. Let's count them down and see if we got it right. There's 1,000, there's 500, there's 200, 100, 50, and 20, which makes six bills. And then we have our coins. 10, 5, 1, 25 cents, 10 cents. And although we never see it, there is actually a one centavo coin that was made during the new um, this design series. But... I have never seen it. Have you? Have you seen? Has any, have any of you seen a one centavo coin? I've only seen it in photos. I haven't actually seen it live. So if you answered 11, we're taking that answer too. So if you answered 11 or 12, you got it right. And that is the end of the pop quiz. And now we've got a special activity for you. And I'm going to leave Ben to talk more about it. Okay. Thanks, Junie. Did you guys guess? or rather answer any of the questions correctly, let us know how many correct answers you got down below. Good job if you, know, you got any of them right. Thank you for listening. Um, for our next seg segment, we asked you guys to print out an activity sheet, which we've linked onto our event page. We hope that you're, you've printed it down below. You've printed it because we're going to use it for our next step. So I've always wanted to know more about the timeline of our recent bills and coins. So thanks for that, Junie. For our live stream listeners this afternoon, are you trying to find a good way to spend your money? If so, you can purchase Kashai Shayan at www.tahananbooks.ph. For increase and updates on events and new releases, follow at Tahananbooks and at Hala Hala Histories on social media. Have you guys printed the Kashai Shayan sheet? Okay. 
because if you have, I'm going to hand you guys over to Benjor, who will lead our activity. Benjor? Hi, guys. I am Benjor, and I am the drawing guy for all the Halo Halo Histories books. Uh, before we do this Design Your Own Money, if you can pin me, I would like to do a, a, a bonus show and tell for you guys. I got some real Philippine, old Philippine money here. So are you guys ready? Okay. So first we have this coin. These are the ones that we talked about. This is from uh, American to Japanese to post-war. So this is one coin. And that was done in... 1908 can you imagine a 1908 coin and you can see the seal of america you see that was the one that divine was talking right divine yeah and i have another one it's the same design it's um 50 cents but this oh, i'm sorry i have to take out the, my background okay this one is 50 cents We'll show it there. There, 50 cents. And um, the seal has changed. Their logo has changed. Remember what Divine talked about with the three stars? Yep, that's it. And then I'm going to present you uh, money from 1922. You see this? There you go. That's Philippines, one peso. And remember what we talked about? This is fun. It says victory. You see that? That's the victory money. Okay, these are real. I found it in my dad's baul. Then we do have our Commonwealth of the Philippines money. There you go. Two pesos. After that, we do have... Um, I actually have Mickey Mouse money. This is 10 pesos. And then it says the Japanese government. Isn't that cool? And the funny thing is there's a one centavo bill. It's tiny. It's really small. There you go. One centavo. That's cool. And finally, we have uh, the Central Bank of the Philippines money in 1949. There you go. And this one features a uh, Barasoyan church at the back. So there, that's my little show and tell. Okay, let's go back to my Kashai Sayan background. Okay, so as I said, I was the artist for all the Halu Halu Histories books. And today we are going to learn on how to make money. Isn't that cool? Your own money. Uh, disclaimer, you can't use this money when you go out shopping in Green Hills or in Mega Mall. Uh, you keep it to yourself. You can actually trade it for real money with your parents if, if they agree. Okay. So, design your own money. Uh, can we feature uh, the first? Okay. This is a 1,000 peso bill. Um, if you see in our book, we, it has different elements. Uh, we have uh, famous people in front. And actually, it's, it's reprinted thrice. Okay, Later, I'll show you. Um, then you have uh, this one is the Medal of Honor. And we have uh, an event here, a Centennial, Philippine Independence Day. Okay, and uh, we have, of course, the denomination, the money, yeah, it says 1,000. And then we have a lot of things, actually. Um, we have Republica ng Pilipinas. Uh, we have two seals, a seal of Fili Republica ng Pilipinas, and we have a seal of Banco Central ng Pilipinas. We have uh, signatures. We have, actually, by buying hidden there, above the 1,000 and the lower right. There you go. And then we do have, uh, of course, the numbers. Uh, they go bigger and bigger. So uh, 
why don't you ask your teacher about that? Why it goes bigger and bigger? Make them work. And then we do have our seals. We have our security strips. There you see that security strip. It's like a secret message for you guys. When I, 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 when I was young, I used to take those out. I know that's bad, but yeah, I wasn't arrested. Okay, so we are going to make our own money. Isn't that exciting? It's going to feature you. So the first one, uh, so again, we can feature, oops, sorry. We can feature a local animal, a local plant, a statue, a hero, yourselves, a hologram, or a hidden message. For now, we're going to use the, uh, the obverse because we don't have time. Um, later, we, we're going to ask you to submit your own design. Isn't that exciting? And then maybe we can do some a small contest. Okay, so first, first you got to draw yourself got to look nice i mean it's going to be a bill so you got to draw yourself and not only that you got to draw yourself thrice so next slide so one big one of you and then if you have um photoshop maybe you can just copy and make two two more can we go to the next slide please yes okay so there you multiply it by 3 depending on how much you love drawing yourself. Okay, we're gonna talk about the third one. That's gonna be a security feature. And we're gonna talk about that later. And then now we add the numbers. I couldn't pronounce the denomination. So we're just gonna add the numbers here in the upper left, and then we're gonna write it down and then the lower right. I chose 623, but you can choose your favorite number. The reason I chose 623 because I was in the grocery yesterday and my bill was 623 and they asked me if i had the exact change and i didn't so it probably would be great if you had the exact change right so yes yeah, 623 for me you can make your own okay next step we do have our you can draw your favorites uh you can draw your favorite plant animal event landmark your house your favorite crush your toy your food or your favorite drawing person which kind of could you know could be me so i decided to put my favorite dog boo is my shih tzu with an, with an initial h and then my favorite event is now that's me talking now at the webinar hi so that's my favorite things okay the next one we are going to put a lot of things. We're gonna put, we're gonna name your country. You're gonna call it Republica ni Divine or uh, Republica ni Juni, Republica ni Micheline, or any fictional character. You can make your own logo for your country. Mine is Republic of Ben, and see me in the middle, and on the left is potato chips, my favorite snack, and on the right, there's a Nintendo Switch, because I love those things. And then on the right, I kind of played with the Banco Central ng Pilipinas logo because it was all lines and I didn't want that. I wanted a cartoon drawing of a, of a falcon or a hawk breathing fire. So you can do absolutely anything you want to. Okay, for the next one, we're almost done. You have to put your secret code. So that's the strip there vertically. It says secret code. You can put anything you want. And then you can put your bye bye in. Uh, there are tools in the internet. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but this is a fun thing to do anyway. You can put whatever word you want. I put mine as Ben Pogi because they don't accept Ben Jor. There's no J in bye bye in. So Ben Pogi. So that's it. And then you can put your signature, you can put your mom's signature, you can put your dad's signature, anything you want. And you can put the Growing letters or numbers, you see that? Lumalake. You can put any number and letter you want because it's your own money. And lastly, we're just going to put a little color there, right? We're going to add some color. I chose mine as salmon because salmon still isn't taken. So that's it. I want to see 
what you come up with. I'm sure it's going to be great. Let's have a little contest. You can put it in one of the posts there, the one where you download, I think. Download the, the templates and you can make your own money. You can make your back too if you want. But uh, due to the time constraints, we just you can do your the obverse. And that's it. I'm looking forward to your money, guys. Have fun. Thanks, Benjar. I hope our audience is going to have so much fun making their own money. So guys, if you actually did do activity, which we encourage you to do, please send it over to Chinatown Museum and we'll feature it on our next live stream next Saturday at 3 p.m. If you're having fun on today's talk, you may purchase Kashai Shayan and other Tahanan books on www.tahananbooks.ph. For increase and updates on events and new releases, follow at Tahanan Books and at Halo Halo Histories on social media. Some people say that money talks. Our coins and bills tell us a lot about what is special about our country and people. In this talk, we hope you learned more about how the bottom line on how money was invented, how it came to our shores, how it's made, and why it looks the way it does. Tasha is, uh is part of a set of other children's books, um, which we mentioned a while ago, which is the book about Jose Rizal and A Long, Long Time Ago. You can get all three books for a discounted price of six ninety five dollars right now. So, you know, if you were to purchase it on the site right now, you can get it for a discounted price of six ninety five. dollars Thank you for tuning in. We'd like to thank our partners for this broadcast, uh, Philippine Cultural College main campus and Manila for Kids for tuning in. Thank you for your support. We'd also like to thank the Hanan Books and Halo Halo Histories for partnering, partnering with us. Thank you to Benjar, to Michelin, to Divine, and to Juni for coming on to our show. I know preparing, you know, it, it, it was a journey. <laughs> but thank you guys for, you know, really coming on. And I hope our audience appreciates um, this live stream is both, you know, something fun to do and as a resource. So, um, okay. For next, ah, uh, for our certificate. So, people are asking about certificates. We will link it down on the comments and we will also put it up on the event page. So, thank you guys for attending Halo Halo Histories talk. And if you would want to get certified for it, we will put the link down again on the on the um, comment section and on the event page. So registration will close 24 hours from when this live stream started. So it will close tomorrow at 3 p.m. So for next week, we'll be taking a look inside Chinatown Museum. So if you want to know more about Binondo's interesting past, or if you haven't been to the museum and you want to see it, you know, like this is the live stream for you. Again, it's on Saturday, 3 p.m. with our resident curator, Janine Cabato. So I guess this is the part where we sign off. Um, can we have all our authors and Benjor come here and just say goodbye to our audience? Okay, Bye. guys, can we, Hi, can um, we unmute? Yeah. Okay, yes. so. And um, before we say goodbye, we just, yeah. Go, go, yeah, go. Before we say goodbye, we'd just like to give a shout out to Principe Royce in the comments who has just informed us that there has since been a 20 peso coin released in our currency. We have yet to see this 20 peso coin. Maybe if anyone's got one and they'd like to send in a photo to Chinatown Museum to share with us, that would be terrific. So shout out to you. Thank you for pointing that out to us. Thanks, guys. We'd like to also thank Tahanan Books. Rennie, Franny, and Meg, you're the best. <laughs> okay, is, and does anyone else have some final words before we go oh, off live? Well, we um, sometimes, well, two things. First of all, that um, just a bit of trivia. Um, our currency won an award for most world's most beautiful currency. One of the world's most beautiful currencies. So... Something to, to appreciate the next time you take out um, cash from your wallet that it's really well thought out, well designed, very colorful, especially if you've traveled and you've used other countries' money. Um, it really tells something about our country. Uh, another thing is that we do also come up sometimes with special commemorative currencies that 
you don't really use to buy stuff because they're more for collecting. I have one of them with me here. I don't know if you can see it. It's Oops. a 2,000 peso bill. You have to take out your background, Micheline. I have to take it out? Well, the background, your there. virtual background, yeah. Maybe, Micheline, you can just hold it to, next to your body. If we can see it. Then. Yeah. There. Oh, there. 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 Can you there see you it? Yes, yes. Much there. better. So that, that's um, President Estrada swearing in. And in the back, it's Fidel Ramos and Corley. Fidel Ramos is waving the flag. So there are some special bills that are used um, for special occasions. They're not meant to be used uh, to buy and sell, but for collection purposes and to remember a special moment in our history. And that's the end of our talk. And thank you so much for the oh, sorry, If I can, sorry. Um, we just wanted to um, tell the kids and um, all our viewers that um, uh, that uh, we hope you learned a lot from uh, from the webinar today. Uh, we hope um, it teaches you how to value uh, our money, but more importantly, how to value our history. Um, please take care of it, uh, learn it by heart, and um, and maybe we'll all be wealthy, not just um, in terms of uh, of wealth, of money, of material wealth, but we're rich also in uh, in our culture and how we take care of. Uh, Please follow okay. Halo Halo Histories on Facebook, guys, and Tahanan Books on Facebook and Instagram. See you there. Thanks, everyone. See you all next Saturday at 3 p.m.